Hey all everybody, uh, welcome to another going back video. Getting Lost number 10, A Heroic Pace, is over a year old now. So I'm here today to follow up on that video and address some of the comments and questions that I received in response to that video. I don't really recommend watching this if you haven't already seen that, because I don't imagine much of this will make sense without knowing what it is I'm referring to from that original video. So if you haven't seen that already, or if you would like to revisit it, feel free to click right up here. But with that out of the way, let's dive in. So right away, I wanted to address a comment from Mundgejeist. I don't think I'm quite pronouncing that right. And this person's username isn't the only one that I imagine I'll be mispronouncing in this video. So I'd like to go ahead and apologize in advance for that. Anyways, they say, that title is awesome. I know it's a little self-indulgent to address a comment that, that's basically just a compliment, but I did kind of briefly want to talk about my titling of these videos. So yeah, I'm a fan of titles that have multiple meanings. Um, a lot of Lost episodes um, kind of had that. The episode titled The Other Woman is one that comes to mind. And for anyone that's ever listened to Michael Giacchino's um, score of Lost, and that has paid attention to the way that he titles um, his pieces of music. You'll know he's a big fan of puns. And so, yeah, when I name these videos and, and even some of the sections within those videos, that's kind of the spirit in which I'm trying to come up with these titles. Even my most simple video titles um, usually have, a, have another meaning. For example, The Outrigger Chase. There's the obvious reason that it's called that, because it's dealing with the question of the Outrigger chase. But I also chose it because the nature of that video was me tracking each of the Outriggers and figuring out where each of them were throughout the series. And so in a way, I was chasing the Outriggers. And then, yeah, with this one, A Heroic Pace, obviously the video is about Charlie Pace and his actions are heroic, so he is a heroic pace. But also, the video is about how, in the heat of the moment, he very quickly makes the heroic decision. So yeah, he makes that sacrificial choice at a heroic pace. It's probably a bit silly that I'm sitting here trying to explain that, but yeah, I'm heavily critical of my videos, um, especially from a uh, production quality standpoint. But really the only element that I'm ever consistently proud of is the titles that I come up with. But really it's just one more thing about Lost that I've always appreciated and that I've kind of tried to um, carry on in these videos, I guess. Then two things happen almost simultaneously. Mikhail appears at the window <laughs> This next comment comes from Anonium LOL, who asks, How did Mikhail survive the fence and the stabbing from Desmond? What this user may or may not be getting at is the idea that Mikhail um, was able to heal to a more drastic extent than most other characters. And while I certainly think it's possible that that could be a contributing factor, I don't think there's necessarily anything supernatural going on with him. Mikhail says to Ben that the fences weren't set to a lethal level when Locke shoved him between the pylons. And we do see later in Season 5 that Sawyer and the other people that were time traveling with him, when they go through the perimeter in 1974, they are also just knocked unconscious and survive the exposure to the fence. Granted, Mikhail's hemorrhaging and seizure um, seems a bit more severe than what happens to Sawyer's group. I personally just find the idea that the, the fence wasn't set to a lethal level as a suitable explanation for why he survived. As for him surviving the harpoon to the chest, I also don't think there's necessarily anything unusual going on here. The harpoon seems to miss his heart. And while he may certainly have still been dying from that wound, I don't find it unrealistic that he could have managed to swim around to that window with a grenade. The fact that Charlie could have made it out alive 
is what makes his sacrifice truly selfless and that much more heroic. Now, this next comment uh, is actually one of several um, that I received um, that were saying essentially the same thing. The only real reason that I chose this user specifically is because it's the only username that I probably won't mispronounce in this video, and that is Scott Phillips, who says, I noticed the biggest thing about Charlie's death is that it's unavoidable, right? Time auto-corrects itself. Desmond told Charlie he dies, no matter what. So in that moment of choosing to close the door or run out, he chose a death that had meaning and accepted his fate. A selfless act to save Claire, Desmond, Turniphead, and everyone else. So the first part of that that I wanted to address is that I do not actually believe that time auto-corrects itself in Lost. The show later goes on to well establish that whatever happened, happened. Which, from a non-linear perspective of time, also means that whatever is going to happen, is going to happen. Now, it's true that Desmond's flashes aren't, strictly speaking, time travel, but even still, the idea that simply knowing the future enables one to change it completely contradicts what the show later goes on to establish. So, in my opinion, what's going on with Desmond's flashes is something different besides only seeing the future. Furthermore, I find the notion of time or the universe or what have you auto-correcting um, to be pretty nonsensical. I've talked about this super in-depth before already on this channel in my video on time travel specifically. If you haven't seen that, I highly recommend it. I think if you're in any way curious about how the time travel in Lost or really any other um, fictional story if you're at all interested in having that explored or explained, I think it's a potentially useful video. So I'll link that here and in the description. But anyways, as I say in that video, the idea that the universe or, you know, fate or whatever you want to call it is so omniscient that if you were to make a change, like saving Charlie from getting struck by lightning, um, that, that it is so all-powerful that it would then course-correct and have him die another way. If that were true, then does it not make more sense that this all-powerful universe or force, whatever you want to call it, would course-correct to avoid Desmond ever being able to see the Flash in the first place? But that's not even the only issue that I have with this idea. Consider if Charlie had actually been struck by lightning, and if that had been how he was originally supposed to die. How incredibly different would the rest of the story look? Without Desmond seeing these flashes, Naomi almost certainly would have died when she crashed on the island because nobody knew that she was around. Charlie wouldn't have been around to volunteer to go down to the Looking Glass. That entire chain of events would not have played out the way that we see it play out. Jack wouldn't have made the phone call, the freighter wouldn't have found the island, at least not the way that we see them find it. And on and on and on, the, the butterfly effect is the notion that every little change ripples out. And there really is no end to the dramatic differences to what played out that there would be if Charlie had just been struck by lightning at the beginning of Season 3. The utterly game-changing consequences that Charlie's actual death has going forward, I would hardly call that a course correction from him not being struck by lightning. Anyways, pretty much none of that is particularly relevant to Scott's main point, because ultimately Charlie thinks that that's true. Charlie thinks that the universe kind of has it out for him, that he's meant to die, and that it's just going to keep happening until he just accepts it. And I do absolutely agree that his choice to go down to the Looking Glass after being told he won't survive that initial dive, that is absolutely him choosing a death and accepting what he sees as his inevitable fate. And I would agree that that in and of itself is a heroic act. But the way I see it and, and the point that I was trying to get across in this video is that his sacrifice actually becomes even more noble than that when he chooses to close the door. 
And that's because right after he enters the code, he says so much for fate. In that moment, he believes he is going to live and that he doesn't have to die. There appears to be a way out, whereas there wasn't before. But then in a few quick moments, a new, very complicated situation presents itself. That being the one that this video is talking about. So now he's in this predicament where he doesn't believe he has to die. There is a choice in which he could live. And even so, he makes the choice to sacrifice himself. So again, I do think his choice to swim down to the station and sacrifice himself, I do think that that was heroic. But I think in that moment, he also believed he was going to die no matter what anyways. So he might as well do this thing that's going to help the people he cares about. Where I think it gets monumentally more heroic is when he feels he has a choice to continue living his life or to lay it down for the sake of the people he loves. All right, so that brings us to the last comment I want to address from someone whose username I'm not even going to try and pronounce. But they say, Why did Desmond's vision about Claire getting on the helicopter not come true? So far, all of his visions had come true, so why not this one? So first of all, I would actually point out that technically, not all of his visions did come true. Technically, he saw flashes of Charlie dying three different times, and in three different ways, and none of those events came to pass. In this whatever-happened-happened happened universe, neither past nor future, both of which are relative terms, can be changed. Therefore, it follows that what Desmond is seeing in these flashes, the ones that never come true, is not the future, and instead something else. Now, this is one of those situations where what I think was actually going on is something that I intend to be a topic of a future video. And indeed, it's one of the many things that I'm kind of building towards with my current series of videos. And so, yeah, now in this video, I'm in this situation where I either um, do what I, I feel like I do a little too much, which is kind of tell you guys to wait for that video or I go ahead and explain my thoughts on it, which the only reason that I'm somewhat hesitant to do that is because I think I will probably make a better case for what I think in a video that is scripted and better edited, not to mention it'll be able to rely on the videos between now and then that will kind of back up some of the things I'm saying. I'm also a little concerned that Explaining it now will make that eventual video less interesting to those that have already seen this because you've already heard my thoughts on it. Now that said, I think I'm going to let how short this video is so far compared to most of my other videos. I think I'm going to let that be the deciding factor and go ahead and share my thoughts on this. So I regard Desmond's visions of Charlie's death to be caused by the man in black. There are many instances in the show where I believe it is heavily suggested that the man in black is manipulating people through their dreams or when they are otherwise mentally vulnerable. Again, there will be videos specifically dedicated to going into the many examples of each of those things that will be coming out in the near future. But I believe Desmond's exposure to that extreme blast of electromagnetism and his mind's dislodging from time. I believe this made him mentally vulnerable, enough so that the man in black could kind of insert these things into what were perhaps genuine flashes of the future. In fact, if you look at the opening sequence of Catch-22, really the only time that we actually see what Desmond is seeing in some of these flashes, if you look real closely, there is a flash in that sequence of when Desmond's group finds Naomi and they're spreading out the parachute to try and catch her when Desmond cuts her down. And in this flash, you can see Charlie's there.
even though earlier in this sequence of flashes, we see Charlie die by getting an arrow to the throat, he still appears in this event, which we know takes place after that would have happened. What this suggests to me is that the vast majority of what Desmond is seeing are genuine glimpses of the future. But the one piece that doesn't fit with the rest of this series of flashes is the one in which Charlie takes an arrow to the throat. And I believe that means that flash specifically is fabricated. Charlie was never going to die that day because Desmond was always going to save him. What happened happened. What is going to happen is going to happen. The way I see it, what the Man in Black is doing is he's putting this idea in Desmond's head, and subsequently Charlie's, once Desmond kind of clues him in on what's going on, this idea that Charlie is inevitably going to die. And the Man in Black's goal here is A, to get a candidate killed, Charlie, and B, influence events in a way that results in the freighter finding the island, resulting in a conflict that could potentially get many, many more candidates killed. And as we do know, candidates do get killed. So this question of why the flash that initially motivates Charlie to sacrifice his life, why this flash of Claire and Aaron getting on the helicopter never comes true, is because it's just another piece that the Man in Black fabricated and projected into Desmond's mind in his vulnerable state. Again, the way I see it, Desmond's flashes and his interpretation of them, it's interesting just how much they work to advance the Man in Black's interests. When you combine that fact with other things, such as what abilities the Man in Black demonstrates over the course of the series, the what-happened-happened happened nature of time that Lost goes on to clearly establish, the inconsistencies in Desmond's flashes that I've just gone over, and the oddly specific way in which his flashes seem to pertain specifically to Charlie, his impending death, and its aftermath. Between the time when Desmond starts having these flashes and the end of season three, Echo, Nikki, and Paolo all die. And Desmond is present for all three of their deaths. And yet when it comes to them, no flashes. So yeah, taking all of that into account, I think the way in which to best make sense of that storyline of Desmond seeing those flashes in my opinion, the most satisfying and sensible explanation is that the man in black was responsible for what Desmond was seeing. Hopefully you guys will still find that eventual video about this subject. Hopefully you'll still find that interesting. And hopefully I did a good enough job explaining it here. But yeah, I think that pretty much covers it uh, for this video. After I release this, I will immediately start working on going back number 11 because getting lost number 11 is also already a year old. So it shouldn't be too long before you see that one as well. And then once that has gone up, uh, I will be working on getting lost number 19. I'm definitely trying to keep the momentum going so that there aren't any more really long breaks between videos. But if you haven't already, Please subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you'll be notified as soon as those videos go up. As always, I hope you guys come back for those. Oh, you're still here. Hopefully that means you enjoyed this video. If so, please consider sticking around and being a constant for this channel by clicking right up here to subscribe. And don't forget to hit the bell icon if you would like to be notified when more videos like this one arrive. In the meantime, feel free to check out previous content from this channel by clicking here or here. Oh no. Please subscribe.